Good evening. Welcome to the May 19th, 2014 Troy City Council meeting. We have the pleasure this evening of having Councilman Pennington give the invocation. If you would please stand for that and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance afterwards. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the chance to be good stewards of this city. We pray that you guide us and protect us, keep the first responders safe, the fire and the police safe today and tomorrow. We pray that you uh, keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you. Troy City Council meeting is called to order. Could we have the roll call, Ms. Bittner? Mayor Slater? Here. Councilmember Campbell? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Here. Councilmember Hoderick? Here. Councilmember Pennington? Here. Councilmember Teets? Here. All present. Before we start our uh, certificates of recognition and special presentations, we have a uh, special guest this evening, and I'd like to ask uh, Kamel Shohida to, uh, to come forward, please. Kamal, would you come forward and bring your guests with uh, you to introduce them to us this evening and tell us what, what's uh, going on this evening? Could I ask Kamel to come forward, please? Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Dane Slater and my friends uh, at City Council. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to introduce to you a very special person from Lebanon. Uh, she's a marathon runner. She's a remarkable person, and she's the founder and president of the Beirut uh, Marathon Association, uh, which is the biggest event in the Middle East uh, in running. Um, she's a global figure in Lebanon and in the Middle East. And uh, she, because of the marathon, she won really the hearts and minds of tens of thousands of people. She's charismatic, she's gorgeous. Kathy Zeta Jones, <coughs> she likes to have her looks. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, without further ado, I wanna introduce you to you, Mel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really honored and humbled to be here with you today. That wasn't on my agenda, but I'm really privileged. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my experience. My name is May El Khalil. I'm, um, uh, I come from Lebanon. Um, I'm a runner, and uh, running to me was uh, something big in my life. So the longer distances I ran, the bigger my dreams became, until one day I was unfortunate when I had a car accident. Actually, I was hit by a truck while training to do a marathon, and uh, I went into a coma and uh, stayed at hospital for two years and underwent 36 surgeries to be able to walk again. And waking up from coma, I realized that I was no longer the same person I used to be. So instead of pitying myself, I decided, and I, I said to myself, if I couldn't run, I wanted to make sure that others could. And that's how the idea of the Beirut Marathon started. Uh, and I wanted to uh, have an international marathon in Lebanon where I could put Lebanon on the international map, invite runners to come to Lebanon, and run under the umbrella of peace. As you all know, Lebanon has been through uh, tough times. We had civil war, and honestly, I don't know why they call it civil war when there is nothing civil about it. But we had uh, uh, almost 30 years of, of uh, issues in Lebanon. So the idea of introducing a marathon in Lebanon wasn't easy. Uh, how could you ask runners who were fighting and killing each other to come and run next to each other? And at the same time, how could you ask people to run a distance of 26.2 miles at a the time they were not even familiar with the word marathon? 
So I had to start from scratch, and I visited almost uh, schools, companies, uh, the president of the country, even militiamen who were involved in the war at that time, asking them to come together and run at the marathon under the umbrella of peace. Um, and uh, the event started in 2003, and since then we've been running for peace. We started with 6,000 runners, and last year we had over 36,000 runners. And uh, we have uh, over 114 NGOs that run with us, and uh, over uh, 140 different nationalities that come to Lebanon carrying with them the message of peace. So I'm here as well to spread the message of peace because I believe in the power of sports and I believe that sports can change the world. So I hope you will accept our invitation as well. Come one day to Lebanon, if not to run, but to support us as well. Thank you so much for listening to me. And here I am, I'm presenting a ribbon that carries peace, love and run, and this is the message I will continue carrying with me. Uh, you might think coming to Lebanon, uh, you'll be running with a, a bulletproof gun. It's not the case. Uh, the media doesn't really give a good image about Lebanon, but we, we are people who love peace and we want to live like anybody else, and I hope I will be able to change the whole, parad the, whole, the whole mentality through sports and through the marathon. So once again, thank you for giving me the chance uh, to share with you my mission. And I've always felt like uh, running is, is not a sprint, it's more, or, or making peace is more of a marathon. It's not a sprint, it's more of a marathon. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. so much thank you thank you for bringing the message to us we appreciate it we really do thank you so much do I have marathon runners <laughs> <laughs> no I run but not a marathon <laughs> Dave's wife actually ran a marathon yeah. uh, by the way I offered the same invitation over the last 10 years to all the people in, Tro in, uh, in Troy yeah. to go to Lebanon a plane load Yes. So anytime they're ready, we'll take them. I hope so. Okay. That's Thank true. you. Thank you very much. Mal is, a, is a true friend of Troy, for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our first order of business is certificates of recognition and special presentations. And C1 will be introduced by uh, Cindy Stewart, the Community Affairs Director. Good evening. Good evening. I, as you know, I do a lot of volunteering myself. So I was very impressed when I read about the Athens High School Student Council that they raised $56,000 for their charity this year. So we thought it was appropriate to have them come and so that council could thank them. I'd like to invite up Christy Pierce. And I don't know if Sean, the co-advisor, if they want to come up. And then they're going to introduce us to some of their, their students. OK, I think I'm going to come down and, and Give a certificate. Sean, all the students can come up. Bring them all up. <laughs> and this is just a small, yeah, just a small portion of them. A lot of them have activities tonight that they're involved in. Come on behind, behind here, okay? I'll start, and then if I could get Christy to uh, take over, sure. is that okay? I'd be happy to. Come on up here with me. <laughs> it's okay. I have uh, several certificates of recognition that uh, I would like to present to you to pass out uh, to the students that helped raise $56,000, uh, which is just incredible. 
Uh, what was the amount last year? 40, 42,000. 42, so even more this year. But uh, we have several certificates here. If I'd, I would like to present those to you, and if you could get those to the, uh, to the students that are here, plus the ones that uh, couldn't come this evening. Um, I, I just want to read a little bit of this certificate, and this is to Christy Pierce. Um, in recognition of your exceptional service to others, Christy, you are to be commended for your outstanding work as the faculty advisor to Athens High School Student Council. During the 2014 Charity Week, the Athens Student Council organized a week-long event which raised more than $56,000 to benefit Desert Angels, a nonprofit organization that send care packages to members of the U.S. Armed Forces deployed overseas. Christy, your leadership qualities and hard work are a credit to yourself, Troy School District, and the City of Troy. As a teacher, you accept and respect each student for who they are, but you also expect each of your students to excel in all they do and to reach out and help others along the way. You have enriched the community as a positive role model for the Athens High School students, teaching them the value of service to others. Congratulations on behalf of the entire city council. Uh, I'd like to present this certificate, certificate of recognition and thank you for all you have done. And I will let you introduce the students and tell a little bit about what they've done. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> He's my co-advisor, so he's well, you know, a partner in crime here. We, re we record this, so if I could get you to speak into the microphone, oh, sure. that would be great. Thank you. This is Sean Dufresne. He's my co-advisor, so he is my partner in crime with this. So anything that we've done was certainly done in tandem together. So he deserves a round of applause as well. summary of the week we have events going on from uh, we started Saturday night to f the following Friday night anything from ice skating to restaurant fundraisers jail and bail during the school day raffles what am I missing volleyball tournament, volleyball tournament and Mr. Athens pageant every day is pretty much jam-packed with different events and it's really um, it's a total community effort um, the kids you see behind you certainly plan it but it is the community and the student body that breathes life into it and really makes it what it is so um, thank you to anyone in the community who participated in any of our events that week do you want to introduce our kids right. I feel like I'm stealing sure, the show I'll just name a few of our representatives here today um, we have Dan Ziegenfelder we have uh, Maya George, so yeah, Jiraj. I always just call her Maya. Uh, but Megan Sturber is our president. We have a couple of our executive officers here. Uh, and then we have Michaela Smith, Hope Ma, Whitney Chen. And then we have Victoria Aran, one of our executive officers. And Morgan Purvis, one of our vice presidents. And Nancy Cast, another one of the, our officers on the executive council. Uh, so we just Christy and I are just honored to, to work with this group, uh, group of students, and um, it's a credit to the to the parents and to the uh, to the community, and uh, we have a very supportive administration as well. And uh, without all of their support, this wouldn't happen year after year, and just continue to as each group challenges itself to try to surpass the previous year's uh, accomplishments. So it's just wonderful wonderful to see year after year. So thank you very much.
<laughs> Thank you, Kamal. God bless you. God bless you. Good night. I'm going to remain down here for our next uh, certificate of recognition for C2. <laughs> I know both, so I'm just going down there. <laughs> I'm not going to not say I. Oh, that's fine. Anybody else want to say hi to C2 is a proclamation for Asian American Pacific Heritage Month, which I would like to call up. Montage, would you come up, please? I know Cindy Stewart, our director, was going to be here, but if you could come behind me, I'd like to present uh, a certificate to you. And if I could uh, read, read this. Uh, I know we did this last year, but it's yes. always an honor for me to uh, read a proclamation for Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, May of 2014. Whereas the vast diversity of languages, religions, and cultural traditions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders continues to strengthen the fabric of American society, and whereas from the arrival of the first Asian and Pacific Islander immigrants more than 150 years ago to those who arrive today, as well as those native to the Hawaiian Islands and to our Pacific Island territories, all possess the common purpose of fulfilling the American dream and leading a life bound by the American ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And whereas during Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we remember the challenges and celebrate the achievements that define our history. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have endured and overcome hardships and headaches. And whereas amidst these struggles, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have contributed in great and significant ways to all aspects of society. They have created works of literature and art, thrived as American athletes, and prospered in the world of academia. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have played a vital role in our nation's economic and technological growth by establishing successful enterprises and pushing the limits of science. And whereas they are serving in positions of leadership within the government now more than ever before, and along with all of our great servicemen and women, they have defended and served the United States with valor from threats at home and abroad. Now therefore be it resolved that the mayor and the city council of the city of Troy hereby pro proclaim the month of May 2014 as Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And be it further resolved that we invite all Troy residents to recognize and celebrate the vital role Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have played in our nation's history, as well as their outstanding achievements today and into the future. This is presented this 19th day of May 2014. It's signed by myself, all members of City Council. Congratulations, and on behalf of City Council, I would like to present this proclamation. Thank you. Mutats, did you want to say anything yes. this evening? Sure. Thank you, Mayor uh, Slater. Thank you, Council members and Troy community members. It's an honor to receive this uh, proclamation on behalf of the community, Asian Pacific community in Troy. Um, I would like to commend the city of Troy to be one of the first few cities to start honoring this month. And Cindy, thank you to you. And uh, Mayor Slater, thank you. Um, it's an honor and um, you continue to do so. So thank you for doing that. Troy is a great community, and much of its beauty and strength lies in its diversity. How do I know that? Of course, the US Census Bureau numbers and population and business and, um, um, and um, uh, employment uh, tell us that. But more importantly, whenever I see and meet somebody from another city, they 
asked me, so you live in Troy? It's a great city. And um, they said, very diverse. And um, I feel very proud of that. And with that feeling, I accept this proclamation. Thank you so much. Okay, C3 is our next uh, presentation. It is the next professional development program with an introduction by Maggie Hughes with her next team, Marcus Vanderpool, Andrew Lavoie, Kathy Costopoulos, Matt Hughes, and Brian Martin. And the cross section of the right of way introduced by Matt Hughes. So welcome, Maggie. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, my name is Maggie Hughes. I graduated from Michigan State University last May in 2013, and I was hired last month as an intern for the City of Troy. Um, I quickly realized, and I'm sure my uh, Fellow interns behind me can attest to this. Working at the city of Troy has been much more than an internship. Uh, the opportunities and uh, responsibilities that I've been given have far exceeded my expectations and the expectations given to the name intern. So we were empowered as a group by the city manager to develop something different and better and we came up with the next professional development program. Uh, we went with next because it's really the next step in your career. It's for recent graduates, it's for people that are still at school trying to get credit for university or for people that are looking to relaunch their career. Just in our first program we already have people that fit in all these definitions. So uh, what NEXT has been able to do is really lay out this very nice framework that we'll be able to institute in the city for future NEXT um, assistants and employees. Mayor, Council, my name is Marcus Vanderpool. I'm the Community Affairs Assistant here. Um, I'm currently at Oakland University finishing up my last semesters in public administration and public policy. Um, I was also called to work on this uh, program and project. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was give interns a new name because interns, it doesn't come with a lot of respect when you're called an intern. Um, whether that's internally, it's not that big of a deal because everyone knows who you are, but externally when you're reaching out to people in the community, um, such as um, citizens or um, just different businesses, they don't really return your calls or answer emails, so we want to give everyone a new name and we figured that um, assistant is, is a great way to put it because it's more than just an internship, it is actually an entry level job. That's the way we look at it and the response Responsibilities, I think kind of coincide with that. Um, also, it looks a lot better on your resumes for the name change. Rather than just an internship, people think you're just learning, but it's much more than that. We're contributing to the city and we really appreciate this whole program and the name change. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Slater, City Council. Mr. Kishnick. My name is Kathy Kostopoulos. I have an undergraduate degree in accounting from Lawrence Technological University, a graduate degree from Central Michigan University in business administration. I took some time off from my career to raise two children in the city of Troy. I have lived here for over 10 years. Um, I'm resuming my career as a next employee now. And um, I'm very proud of that. And I'd like to point out that if you look at the home page on the City of Troy's website, you will see there um, we boast about live in Troy, work in Troy, play in Troy. And I can check the box and say I'm now doing all of that. And I am very proud to be here. I work as an accounting assistant for the director of finance, Ms. Lisa Burnham. 
Currently, I'm assisting with functions in accounting, such as accounts receivable, accounts payable, and payroll. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Brian Martin. I'm a finance assistant. It doesn't go up that high. Yeah. Totally <laughs> <laughs> relevant. Just speak loud. That's okay. okay. I'm currently pursuing a finance degree at Central Machine University. In my first week here, I was able to attend an ERS board meeting, which has to do with uh, investing for the retirement funds. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, I am got in charge for a stock market challenge for all the employees, and that'll be starting next week. And it's for all the employees to get a better understanding of the stock market. So that's what I've been up to. Isn't that Thank you. All right, look, Mayor. You look different than I saw you this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, got the, got the suit on. Um, Mayor, council members, uh, my name is Matthew Hughes. I am the uh, DPW Streets assistant. Um, I'm going to Wayne State University right now, uh, studying civil engineering. Um, so with this next program that we're trying to launch, I guess I would say I'm a um, a good outcome so far, or maybe a example of that. Um, before I was hired here, uh, I got the privilege to um, meet Mr. Kiznick, city manager, while I was sitting in the HR office. Uh, little did I know he was the city manager at the time. <laughs> and, um, you know, he asked me a couple questions, and uh, we started talking a little bit. And he, uh, he challenged me right off the bat. Uh, he asked me to um, help him think of something, some kind of educational tool um, that we could use to uh, help inf inform residents and uh, also promote uh, infrastructure spending. So I had about a month before I started here to come up with some ideas. And uh, I came up with that. So I presented it to him. Um, after my first week. And what I came up with is a uh, typical cross-section, typical right-of-way of a road that we have here in Troy. Um, and what I like about this is that it shows a lot of the important things that we have infrastructure-wise that we rely on every single day that you, you don't see every day as well. Um, we spend a lot of money on infrastructure, and a lot of people don't realize where, do, where is it all going. We don't really see any improvements, etc. cetera. Um, so a funny story about this, uh, after I presented it to Mr. Kiznick, he uh, took it up to his office on a bright, sunny day and uh, put it up on his windowsill. And uh, the sun is baking it. As you can see, it's enclosed. So. Uh, this is this is all real dirt and different layers in here, and the moisture that was still left in here caused the sidewalk to heave upwards, <laughs> become uneven. Uh, by coincidence, uh, at the DPW, that's my responsibility this summer as a sidewalk replacement program. So that was very interesting. <laughs> that's appropriate. Um, also, which I presented earlier today as well, um, this is a time phase uh, of the aging and deterioration process of Portland cement concrete. Um, you can kind of get a good view of this if you travel on Long Lake lately. There's a lot of potholes. Um, but basically, starting from brand new, you have the construction side where it's um, brand new cement, and it, it goes into some details or some notes um, along the bottom here that kind of explain some of the things that are happening on, or why, what, why, what makes uh, cement start cracking, potholes, uh, talks about some of the problems um, chemically. Um, so we have brand new to worst case scenario, water mains, potholes, et cetera. Um, so I, I hope that these models um, inform citizens and also promote future infrastructure spending and well, more importantly, uh, maintenance, uh, spending money on maintenance. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Are there any questions for us? 
And those models will all be available for everyone in the city manager's office if anyone would like to come and have a look at them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Stay, stay up for a second. Okay. Um, I just want to say um, to uh, the city manager Kishnick that, um, you know, th this is really fantastic that uh, you would bring uh, the youth of today to, uh, to help the city because um, I know a lot of people are thinking in today's world, um, you know, what's going to happen in the future? And all you have to do is look at, mm -hmm. and, and no, no offense to somebody that's been there and done it before, but the, uh, the young kids that are coming out of college today, um, when you sit down and you talk to them and you see what, I, I was mentioning today that um, that this piece of uh, design here on the streets, just looking at it, I was going to ask the city manager to, to do something that it probably would have taken 45 pages to, to get out, and this in one s small little display took care of all of the questions that I wanted to have written in a, probably a 45-page document. But um, I, I feel really good about the world and this generation right here that, that's coming up because you think, um, you think out of the box and you don't have to be told very much. Um, you, you really know what to do. And thank you, uh, Mr. Kishnick, for putting this group together. It's been an asset to our city, I know that. And uh, did you want to say anything? Uh? I'll always say something, especially with this group, as I've always said. We have uh, so many examples of, of great people on staff, right, uh, that, that I, I was fortunate to come into this community a year and a half ago and work with so many talented professionals. And the, the one thing that just happens, because I got started doing free internships, uh, in this business, um, which is either a good or bad thing for me, uh, but that these people have so much to give and so much creativity and energy and intelligence uh, that we bring them into the organization and it rises the whole organization up. It's a, it's a real r great opportunity for all of us to work together and them to have a peer group to work with, and that's what we've tried to do. And they've all done a great job of, of uh, adding value to the city of Troy. So we're very fortunate. And thanks to Kathy for coming back and uh, um, giving back to the community. Because I think that's what you're doing is giving back, uh, much like uh, my colleagues here. So thank you all. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. C4 is our next presentation, and uh, there will be an introduction by Steve Vendett, the city engineer, and Paul Evans, the zoning and compliance specialist, and police officer Milt Stansberry. So on that, Steve, I will let you discuss Troy Roads Rock 2014 program. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to be here this evening to talk about my favorite subject, and that is roads and road reconstruction, road construction, period. And I'm happy to have a captive audience to, to speak to. Tonight I'm giving you a uh, brief status report on Troy Roads Rock. It's our $10.5 million partnership with the Road Commission for Oakland County and the state to fix major roads damaged in part by the harsh winter that we had. Uh, this year and in part by uh, overweight vehicles on our roads during the spring um, um, spring thaw. Later in this presentation, Officer Stansberry uh, is going to talk about uh, weight restrictions and uh, uh, what uh, overweight trucks can do to our roads. Uh, right now, I'm going to show you a few pictures of the roads that we are currently working on. <clears throat> Uh, Long Lake Road is the road that we started on. You see the, the picture down at the bottom. Uh, that road predominantly has uh, damage from ASR. ASR is alkali silica reactivity, which um, began, it be, uh, became noticeable in the 1990s. Um, and since then, there have been additives developed uh, that will combat ASR. Uh, in the late 
90s when most of Long Lake was built from Rochester to Livinois, the remedy that was used for ASR, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm going to be making a presentation in June and I'll get into ASR in a little bit more detail, but uh, back in uh, the late 90s, what was used to remedy ASR uh, was uh, slag cement, or I'm, I'm sorry, slag aggregate. And that's, uh, slag is a byproduct of the um, blast furnace uh, operation, production of iron. It's a waste product and it was used to uh, mitigate the uh, effects of, of ASR, which leads to that map pattern that you see on the screen, which <clears throat> can either hold up for a while or it can start to, to pop. And it usually takes about five years before ASR uh, starts to appear and it can stay like that for a long time. This is actually on Long Lake, or once it starts to pop and potholes start to form, it can accelerate very rapidly. The reaction is it's a, well, I won't get into that, I'll do that next week, but um, today, uh, starting in the uh, 2000s, thereabouts, we use either type two cement, which is a low alkali cement, or uh, ground up um, slag, which is ground to the consistency of cement. And that actually has, uh, that slag has the, the uh, properties of cement and it's replaced, it replaces approximately up to 40% of the cement is replaced by the ground uh, slag. And that uh, does an excellent job to mitigate ASR. And in fact, uh, most of Long Lake, as I might have mentioned, it was uh, built in 97. Um, it's 17 years old. It's in 2008, when it was 11 years old, showed very little signs of any ASR or any uh, problems with the road. Now, here we are six years later, and it's practically um, falling apart completely. Compare that to Big Beaver out here between uh, City Hall and uh, Rochester Road, which was done in 2001. Uh, so it's only four years younger out here, but you would be hard pressed to find any problem with uh, Big Beaver out here between City Hall and, and Rochester Road. It's made that much of a difference in, in concrete. So a couple pictures of uh, Square Lake Crooks area, Livernoy Long Lake area, the ravages of, of ASR and, and time, and I think the um, winter that we had, I think, uh, really accelerated the aging process of our roads by at least two years. It's, it's quite dramatic from last year to this year. Um, on John R., we also have significant, prompt, <coughs> significant problems with ASR, but we also have a lot of random cracks and uh, deterioration at the joints. So getting into uh, the construction project, we started construction on Long Lake uh, about four weeks ago, and uh, that started with sawing the concrete and getting it ready for removal. The sawing took uh, about two weeks to complete, and uh, after that, uh, they removed significant segments of Long Lake Road. And as I mentioned, Long Lake, uh, the vast majority of it had ASR, and when we're done, you will see a practically brand new road, except for the, the center turn lane, uh, quite a bit of that is being left in place, but the vast majority of Long Lake is being removed and replaced. So we started uh, removal about two weeks ago, and then um, on May the 8th, uh, they started pouring concrete, and they've poured every weekday since, including Saturdays except last week we had about a day and a half of, of rain and they did not pour uh, for about a day and a half. So we started on a long lake just uh, east of Rochester and worked our way west. This is the westbound side. And um, when we got to Rochester Road, there were um, some slabs and uh, segments actually of Rochester Road that needed a re replacement and that resulted in Rochester Road going down to one lane in each direction. You can imagine the backups that occurred from that. Uh, we worked with the Road Commission for Oakland County to give Rochester Road more green time and that resulted in about 90 seconds of green time. 
for Rochester Road and then it started to back up a little bit on Long Lake, but it helped quite a bit. Um, the good news was this only lasted about a week and that was due in part to the uh, what we call the concrete breaks. It's the testing that's done on concrete where it's molded, the fresh concrete is molded into a cylinder and then um, brought to the lab, put into a machine and uh, compressed in that machine until it breaks and then you measure the force that was uh, needed to do that and calculate the compressive strength or PSI pounds per square inch of that concrete. And so on uh, Rochester Road, after three days, we were getting 3,500 to 4,000 pounds per square inch compressive strength, which exceeded the minimum of 2,800 uh, PSI to open the road to traffic. So after only about a week of this, um, of these backups on Rochester Road, we were able to, to uh, reopen it. Unfortunately, when we do the eastbound side, we're gonna be closing it again and there's gonna be uh, more traffic disruption. Contractors made excellent progress. This is about halfway um, between Rochester and Livernois. And um, today they, are, they finished up uh, pouring all the way uh, west of Livernois to the western terminus and uh, they're starting if they didn't start today they will tomorrow start pouring on the west side uh, and and work I'm sorry on the south side and work their way east Steve that's Long Lake there pardon me that was Long Lake there yes Long Lake yes uh, this is a, a map of the overall uh, program <clears throat> uh, while they are working on um, Long Lake with uh, pouring concrete and also removing concrete ahead of the pour crew. About two weeks ago, they started on John R. Uh, doing uh, saw cutting on John R. between Maple and uh, Roch or between Maple and and Waddles. And there, we expect that there will be an overlap, such that there they will still be doing concrete work on um, on Long Lake. Um, and they will be starting some concrete work on John R. At, at the same time. Now the criteria that we use for, repla for marking it for replacement, it's a criteria that, um, is, that I've developed and I've discussed the criteria with uh, DPW who's doing, it's, it's us that's doing the marking, not the road commission, they're doing the inspection part. We're marking the slabs for replacement and uh, we do that by looking at uh, whether it's got ASR, uh, whether it's got uh, severe um, damage at the joint such that it can't be simply repaired with a joint sealer. And our overriding principle is that we want to, when we're done, we want to have these roads in a condition where we don't have to do major repairs to this road for 10 years. And so when we're done, it's going to look like it's going to look like a new road. However, there will be some slabs that have some uh, cold patch in it. Those slabs still have service life left in it. Uh, and there may be some slabs that need repair after 10 years, but we won't have the broad replacement uh, need that, that, that's going on right now. I'm sorry, going back to the, to the map, uh, the, the um, roads that are in green, those are uh, Big Beaver and Crooks Road. Those are uh, the lead agency for those is the Road Commission for Oakland County. And right now the plans and specs are being finalized and they expect to be out for bid in July and construction could start in August. The schedule for all this, uh, except for Long Lake, which we know is going to be done um, by the end of June, however, there may be some little odds and ends that might uh, go a little bit longer, but for all intents and purposes, the majority of it will be done by the end of June. Um, the rest of it, we will go to John R. next. Um, and then after that, it's a little bit fuzzy right now. We don't know exactly which road or when we're, we're going to uh, move to. And so, um, Information about that will be announced uh, throughout the summer as we go through the construction and it'll be put on our website, uh, Troy Roads Rock. Go to TroyRoadsRock.com and the website comes up and it gives you uh, a, almost a daily uh, update on what lanes are closed and what work is being done at that particular time. 
At this point, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Paul Evans, who is going to uh, talk about how the city is helping the business community cope with the construction. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Good evening. Good evening. Well, what the Troy Roads Rock uh, staff did is we identified that almost 1,000 businesses, non-residential entities, uh, offices, would potentially be affected by road lane closures in the project areas. So uh, the reason why we did that identification is the city sign code allows these businesses to have some additional signage while the lanes in front of their businesses are closed. So um, and I'm involved because I'm the guy who reviews and issues the sign permits. Mm -hmm. So what you see on the overhead here is a postcard that we sent to all the known non-residential entities in the project areas. Now the postcard summarizes the project and also explains that anyone who wants to get a sign permit can do so by emailing me and just emailing me their sign permit application. Now the applications are free and I'll return them back to everybody via email. So I received some phone calls and I've issued about five permits so far and we're going to continue that throughout the uh, course of the project. Now, we know that even though we have an extensive database here in Troy, we're not confident we might have hit all businesses. That's just the nature of how it works. So in addition to the mailings, we asked Bob Schultz of our Department of Public Works to make personal visits to every business owner that we can in the project areas as the project's moving along. So he's got a stack of postcards that he's going to knock on the doors of businesses to make sure that everybody knows what's going on, the, uh, a little bit about the project, and the fact they can get uh, signed permits if they need them. So that's how we're trying to reach out to uh, help out the affected business community in dealing with uh, road construction. We all know that there's never really a good time to do any road construction, so we're trying to uh, make it as painless as possible. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the award-winning officer Milt Stansbury. And he's gonna <laughs> Milt's going to talk a little bit about what the police do to protect our roads. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Hello. I think I have most people Good here. I think we accept you. One. I'm Officer Stansbury. I've been with the city of Troy for over 23 years. Thank you. Uh, I've been with a motor carrier. Uh, I've been a motor carrier officer for uh, well, almost 20 years now, uh, so I had some experience uh, uh, with some of these heavyweight trucks we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I was asked to come here specifically to speak about the Frost Law, and what is the Frost Law? Frost Law is actually a layman's term for what the state refers to as seasonal reduced loading, and that's during the time of the spring thaw. All right? And the spring thaw, how it affects the roads is obviously it's more fragile as to Folks will tell you that in the engineering department, I uh, spoke with uh, uh, Mr. Van Dett and uh, with the county officials. And what we, d what we did this year is during that time of March, April, and May is when the state says that we put provisions in there that uh, municipalities and the state themselves and counties can uh, enact this reduced loading on our roads. And it's different for different types of roads. Uh, this year they took effect uh, March 19th when the, we were in lockstep with the county. Uh, Cindy Stewart put it on our city web page. Uh, we also, the, the reduced loading uh, effect was till the 28th of April, quite some time. I don't ever remember it being this long in all my years here. As a matter of fact, I just checked my uh, email today and the state notified me that there is still frost law in effect through almost the end of the month uh, in, the, in the UP. I've, I've never seen it like this. Hmm. So the effects of uh, uh, the Frost Law, uh, we, we notified by our web page. We also signed our lowest roads so that industry is aware of it. So they can make provisions to either lighten their loads on those that they're, where their loads are too heavy, or they can either route their vehicles if they're overweight around it. So it's in place. So business can be conducted. Uh, what he, the slide he has up here is one of the trucks that uh, I, I happen to stop this one. I worked with uh, my partner, uh, Officer Linton, uh, during that period of time. We stopped approximately 120 trucks that we suspected that were overweight. Um, they were all overweight. 
just some more so than others, we, uh, with, with no exceptions. This is a particularly heavy one. Uh, the weight on this truck uh, would have been overweight anywhere, I think, in North America during any time. Uh, also, the reason you see it at the DVW <laughs> yard is I noticed that it had some particular uh, safety defects, so I put on my coveralls and uh, blocked the wheels and went underneath it and, and looked at the brakes. That truck has 11 axles, which is the maximum allowed in the state, so it has 22 brakes. Of the 22 brakes, 10 of them were deemed out of service. Oh my God. So there's a safety component to this also. So you've got this big heavy truck. Um, and by the way, our state allows double the weight of any other state I'm aware of. We, well, most states allow 80,000 gross. We allow up to, on that configuration, allow 160,000. And that's if they're in compliance. So they're, they're very well as this one is, can be overweight. Uh, so that was placed out of the service. They had to uh, bring in a mechanic to make repairs before it was uh, released, or they, if they choose to try to tow it, they can do that too, but they're given an option. And uh, they requested if they could donate the overweight sand they had in it. And uh, the DPW agreed that they could donate it to them. And so it made them within legal limits. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, here's some of the uh, other damage. Now, this is on I-75, and you think, well, on I-75, that's not one of our roads that uh, we maintain. Why would we care? Uh, well, we provide service to people on I-75. Uh, this is a particular uh, place that uh, I, I happened to be at one day, and I noticed that uh, there was a big hole in the road, and shortly thereafter, we, we had calls for people that had uh, damaged rims and tires. And uh, if you look in the photo, the upper left one, the car in comparison to that hole, you can see it's, that's a very large hole. Uh, that could have very easily caused a, a, a crash. And I think that might be the front of my vehicle there. I blocked that area. Uh, we're not gonna leave. I-75 is not one of our roads we maintain, but you're not gonna allow uh, uh, someone to hit that. Uh, and downstream, like I said, there's more cars that are damaged. And here's some of the debris in the roadway at the bottom slide. And uh, as you, if you compare those with the vehicles in the background, those are approximately the size of a softball or maybe to a volleyball size. Well, a car ahead of the vehicle up in the upper right struck that hole, put that one of those pieces airborne, and this, this poor guy behind him, he, he missed the hole, but he didn't miss the debris. And it bent that pillar right there next to his window and on into his windshield. He uh, luckily he didn't have a passenger. That could have been really bad. And it, see, it scarred his hood, too. Uh, Ed might, I don't know if you saw this car later or not. You can't <laughs> see it. But anyhow, the driver had glass in his hair and, and ears and eyes. He was, he was pretty shaken up. And I would have been, too. It was pretty scary. So this has a safety component to it also, our roads, and instead of just uh, the money uh, to repair them uh, so we don't bend our rims. But this could have been very bad had there been a passenger in that vehicle. So that's what the police department's doing about it, is that we, uh, by direction of, of my superiors, we ramped up our, our uh, uh, as far as monitoring of, of our roads. And I, 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 we have in years past, but we did more so this year. Any questions from anyone? Thank you. Councilman Pennington. Milt, I know you uh, ramp up the enforcement during that frost law time, but you're, you've also got guys that are weighing trucks all year, long, all year round, right? Uh, myself and Officer Linton are the only two uh, trained to do it, and we do do it all, all year long. And as a matter of fact, uh, it was uh, a few days after the frost law had been lifted, I still got more overweight vehicles on normal roads that were uh, it was outlandish. It was, it was still overweight. I'm told, well, in my state police counterparts and county, we all talk, and uh, there's also studies that point this out. In urban areas, there is very little enforcement, and the, right. some of the industry knows that because in the urban areas, what, there's a lot of trucks, a lot of traffic, and very few officers. And uh, my father, I spoke to him today about it, and he will tell you the same thing. He used to be a truck driver. And uh, he concurs with that, you know. 
And so uh, we did ramp it up because that is the longest frost law period that I've seen. But uh, uh, you take a look at the roads, and, and uh, it needs to be monitored closely, obviously. Thank you. Anything else? Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Henderson. Just, uh, when you see a truck that size, you can guess that it's probably overweight. But how do you actually do you require them to go to a weigh station pull them over and, and great, go great question is that uh, we, we have a, we're fortunate most places do not have this the scales at the DPW that we have and it's a 10-foot platform and we can weigh them in groups which is to their favor because we average out the weight over those axles because we're an axle state we're not actually a gross weight state or some states are we actually we actually define what you can weigh on an individual axle, and there's other components that go to it as far as spacing and whatnot, as far as the footprint it's putting on the road and the damage it could cause. And so that platform, we can still single stuff out, but we can weigh them as a group, and it goes in their favor because then you're not picking out the heaviest axle. And it's, uh, uh, so we have those scales there, they're certified. And uh, they were down recently on that truck I spoke to you uh, just a moment ago that was after the frost loss is uh, they were repaving the the lot there and we couldn't get to the scales so the county graciously came out to a parking lot with their portable ones and uh, and waited for us but that is way more time consuming because you have to uh, really lay out all these different panels for each axle so it's all in a level uh, area to weigh it and it's very it's way more time consuming it takes minutes to actually weigh one where there it, it, it took 20 minutes to weigh it with portable scales so that's how we do it we weigh it at our city scales councilman Fleming. yeah officer stands very very informative you indicated that michigan allows gross weight of about 160,000 pounds but that was more than any other state that you were aware it's, of it's how more than any state i'm aware of i did some searching and i can't find uh, now through special permits uh other states allow more but uh, uh, that's for special moves, usually for one-time moves. Uh, but then again, I just checked into that, and the highest one that I could find in recent history was a half-million-pound move in another state. Well, our state allowed a 1.5-million-pound move, and uh, it was at a flat rate of $50. I don't think that really compensates for roads repair. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a part of the accounting yeah, but I don't think those add up to well. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Even with cop math. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you. Cop math has to be simple. <laughs> Any other questions uh, for Mr. Vendette or, or anyone? Actually, I had one question for Steve on the, uh, the one slide that had, uh, thanks, thanks Mel. Thank you. Thank you. That had uh, DeQuinder on there. This map? Yeah. Yes. Um, just so the, the uh, public knows, um, we are not, we're, it, it kind of shows that we're doing both sides of DeQuinder, but we're just doing the southbound. We are just doing the southbound side. There is a northbound component. It's uh, uh, north and south of Maple, and that is being uh, paid for by uh, Sterling Heights. And so our contractor is doing the work, but it's being paid paid for by others. Okay. So we're, but. Technically speaking, we're not doing, we're not spending any of our money in anyone right. else's time. But it will be done the same time. It will be done okay, the same good. time. Okay, Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for the updates. It, it helps us uh, because we get a lot of questions. I told Steve today that I think a lot of people would be surprised that Long Lake is 17 years old um, yeah. because a lot of people think that. Um, we just did that road. For some reason, it uh, doesn't seem like it's been 17 years, but uh, it has been. Thank you. That concludes our section for certificates of recognition and special presentations. Uh, there are no carryover items, no public hearings. I don't see that anyone has signed up for public comment this evening. There are no postponed items, so we will move to regular business. First order of business is boards and committee appointments. So I would like to move the resolution to appoint the following nominated persons to serve on the Brownfield 
Redevelopment Authority, Rosemary Karnecki, for the term to expire 430 of 2017, and Robert Schwartz for the term to expire 430 of 2017. Support. Moved by the chair and supported by Councilman Pennington that we appoint Rosemary Karnecki and Robert Schwartz to the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority for terms that expire 430 of 2017. Discussion? The vote, Ms. Bittner. Mayor Slater? Yes. Councilmember Campbell? Yes. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Councilmember Pennington? Yes. Councilmember Teets? Yes. Motion passes. Now I'd like to appoint for the Planning Commission Karen Cruz for the term to expire 12-31-2014, and that is the current term that was vacated by Robert Schultz, who resigned on 3-25-2014. Moved by the Chair and supported by Councilman Campbell that we appoint Karen Cruz to the Planning Commission for the, for the term that expires 12-31-2014. Discussion? Um, Ms. Cruz's application is on file if you uh, mm -hmm. choose to look at it um, further. The vote, Ms. Bitter. Councilmember Campbell? Yes. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Councilmember Pennington? Yes. Councilmember Teets? No. Mayor Slater. Yes. Motion passes. There are no city council appointments this evening, so next is I-2 board and committee nominations. And uh, I understand, Mayor Pro Tem Henderson, you have a nomination this evening. Yeah, I'd like to, for the Historic District Commission, uh, I'd like to nominate um, Paul McCown uh, to replace Ann Partland, who wishes to not be reappointed for that. Paul McCowan. Paul McCowan. Yeah. Support. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Henderson, supported by Councilman Pennington, that we appoint Mr. McCowan to the Historic District Commission for the term that expires 3 1 of 2017. Discussion. The vote, Ms. Pittner. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Councilmember Pennington? Yes. Councilmember Teets? Yes. Mayor Slater? Yes. Councilmember Campbell? Yes. Motion passes. I-3 is a request for closed session. Okay. Councilman Fleming? Move that be resolved that Trust City Council shall meet in closed session as permitted by MCL 15.268E, pending litigation, TR, Purpose Act, versus the city of Troy. Support. By Councilman Fleming and supported by Councilman Campbell that we meet in closed session this evening as permitted by law. Are we also meeting this evening to discuss city managers? Uh, uh, Mayor, the, uh, at your last meeting, there was a resolution that called that uh, for the same same closed session, so both of those items will appear. Okay. Discussion? The vote, Ms. Binner. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Councilmember Pennington? Yes. Councilmember Teets? Yes. Mayor Slater? Yes. Councilmember Campbell? Yes. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Motion passes. I-4 is the film and video ordinance amendment. Introduction by Brenda Carter, interim assistant to the city manager. Good evening. Good evening, city council. Before you is the film and video ordinance documentation that was presented to you on May 12th city council meeting. This documentation has been vetted by all staff that's involved in the city, uh, in the film and video process. California is expanding the, film, the filming industry in Michigan. And of course, we know that Troy has been a part of the filming industry. This documentation was created to streamline the filming process, therefore encouraging more applicants. Applicants are given a letter of intent. If an, or if an applicant is determined to be exempt, 
the process stops there. But if the applicant is non-exempt, then they're given the entire packet that is before you. The packet includes the amended document 61A. What 61A uh, includes is all the requirements for filming in the city of Troy. It also ensures that filmers do not, um, they're not intrusive in our, to our residents and it identifies potential traffic uh, blockages, noise, and hazardous, potential hazardous activity. Chapter three was amended to include the amended chapter 61A in our, administra our list of administrative services. And chapter 60 was amended to include all the fees associated with chapter, the amended chapter 61A. These ordinance, these ordinance amendments are in compliance with Michigan Film and Digital Media Assistance Program, MCL 125-2029-8, which is required by all municipalities in order to film. We are asking that you consider our proposal for adopting this ordinance. Are there any questions? Questions from Ms. Carter? Thank you, Brenna. Thank you so much. Councilman Pennington. I would like to move I-4, the film and video ordinance, introduced by Brenda Carter as printed. Support by Councilman Pennington and supported by Mayor Pro Tem Henderson. To My computer just went off. That we, uh, we vote on uh, I-4, the film and video ordinance amendment as printed. Discussion? The vote, Ms. Binner? Council Member Hoderick? Yes. Council Member Pennington? Yes. Council Member Teets? Yes. Mayor Slater? Yes. Council Member Campbell? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Yes. Pop back up, thank you. Motion passes. I-5 is the traffic committee recommendation request for removal of a no parking zone sign at 1914 Weatherby with an introduction by Bill Hootery, Deputy City Engineer. Good evening, Bill. Good evening. Uh, not quite as tall as the one gentleman earlier, so. He's pretty tall. Yeah, he's tall. Very tall. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, at, the traf at the April traffic committee meeting, there was an item uh, on that agenda to remove the no parking restrictions on the south side of Wither Witherby, uh, across from Pembro Pembroke Elementary. Um, by a four to two vote, the traffic committee members recommended that the no parking zone be removed. Uh, the north side of the road is no parking all the time due to fire hydrants. The south side is no parking, just AM arrival and PM dismissal times. Um, that recommendation was forwarded to city council at your meeting on May the 12th. Uh, at that meeting, Mayor Slater, with the support of council, pulled the item for further review by uh, police and fire. Uh, police and fire did go out and review the area. They did meet with uh, Susan Crocker, the principal, and all parties uh, agreed that Witherby is a narrow road, and with parking on uh, one side, it would even be uh, uh, much more restrictive for the buses. One of the big things they looked at was buses coming out of the bus loop making a left turn onto Witherby. Um, and the feeling that they had would, it would be a, a bigger issue with parking on the south side. Um, the police and fire, there's a memo included with the agenda item tonight that does recommend no changes. Um, the original recommendation made at the traffic committee meeting was no changes. Um, and Witherby is not unique. Uh, most all of the schools in the city have parking restrictions on both sides, primarily uh, AM and PM arrival and dismissal times because it is just it's a large volume of traffic that occurs in a very short period of time 15 20 minutes if you've never uh, experienced it go to one of the high schools during the dismissal time and it's it's uh, akin to a tidal wave it really is amazing um, they do a wonderful job with uh, what they have um, but it is something that the the parking restrictions do help um, they don't always work um, a lot of the parents like to park or stand, um, but if the signs were removed, it would be open game for anyone, not just residents. 
Um, and that was part, I think, the biggest part of the discussion with the traffic committee members was um, the feeling that the residents, we've got residents there with three, four vehicles, um, having to go out to move vehicles in a.m. or p.m. if they were home. Um, and that's kind of where I believe their thought process was. But in the uh, uh, thinking of safety and movement of traffic and students and buses, and it, it, the recommendation was to uh, keep the uh, parking zones as is, and it's backed up further by uh, police and fire. Any questions? Questions for Bill? Uh, Councilman Teets? I should have uh, given you a heads up on this question before, but uh, my, my question is simply this. H has that arrangement for parking been that way for it several was, years? It was originally placed in 2006. When the item went to traffic committee, I found the old minutes when the, the signs were approved. Um, originally, they went up when Pembroke was doing site improvements. So a lot of the teachers were parking on the street. That no longer occurs. Uh, Principal Crocker has said she's, she will email all her parents. Um, she said her staff does not currently park on the street. And that was some of the confusion. One of the gentlemen that showed up at the meeting, Mr. Dietz, was at the 2006 meeting. And his understanding or his impression was that the signs were put up temporarily. Um, if you read the minutes, really what it was was a compromise to only restrict it during a.m. and p.m. times rather than all the time, um, which is more consistent with the schools and the schools in Troy. This is a Birmingham school district, but it's, it also is uh, on the border of Troy there. That's my point. Yeah. Councilman Campbell. Is Witherby a, uh, not as wide as what most roads in Troy? No. I drove by there. It seemed like... It was like, if you put a bus out there with kids. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is narrow. We didn't measure it. Um, but yeah, it does appear that way. And one of, the, one of the bigger issues is during the winter, especially the winter we just had, um, when we get snow, and most of the schools experience this, it, it creeps in the road. And so people that park or stand waiting for their kids or dropping them off, um, it even makes it narrow. One of the worst schools is Morse uh, off at Cherry. Um, that one, we've got more of no parking signs per per foot than probably any place else in the city, but it's still, especially in inclement weather, um, and that's really when you notice the no parking issues is um, when it's snowing, when it's raining, and then this winter when we had piles of snow creeping out into the road, it really created a, a lot of problems at a lot of the schools. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Bill. You have you. answered all the questions that I have and for the reason that I pulled it. So. Um, with that, um, I'm the one that asked to have it pulled, so I will move the resolution I-5 for the request for removal of a no parking zone at 1914 Witherby, resolved that no changes be made to the no parking restrictions along the south side of Witherby between Grayfield and Eaton from 8.15 to 9.15 a.m. and 3.15 to 4.15 p.m. on school days. Support. Moved by the chair and supported by council and Fleming that we approve I-5 as read in the record. Discussion? The vote, Ms. Bittner. Councilmember Pennington? Yes. Councilmember Teets? Yes. Mayor Slater? Yes. Councilmember Campbell? Yes. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Motion passes. Next is the consent agenda. Does anyone on council wish to pull a consent agenda item this evening? Councilman Fleming, did you want to move the resolution? Yes, resolve that Troy City Council hereby approves all items on the consent agenda as presented. Second by Councilman Fleming and supported by Councilwoman Hoderick that we approve all items on the consent agenda as printed. Discussion. I would just like to note that the um, one agenda item that was on the regular business is on the consent uh, regarding the solid waste plan this evening that was the presentation was made last week. The vote, Ms. Bittner. Councilmember Teets. Yes. Mayor Slater? Yes. Councilmember Campbell? Yes. Councilmember Fleming? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Henderson? Yes. Councilmember Hoderick? Yes. Councilmember Pennington? Yes. Motion passes. If you were here on a consent agenda item, they were all approved this evening. 
Next is memorandums and future council agenda items. K2 A is an amendment to the chapter 20 of the Troy City Code Water and Sewer Rates. KB is a resolution to permit use of shell crackers to disperse migratory waterfall at the Emerald Lakes subdivision. I don't see that anyone has signed up for public comment for items not on the agenda from Troy residents and businesses. There are no council referrals. Council comments this evening. Council have any comments on the reports uh, that were placed in the agenda this evening? I don't see that anyone has signed up for comments on items on or not on the agenda from members of the public outside of Troy. There are no study items this evening. So we will adjourn for the closed session this evening. We'll meet in the boardroom in about five minutes.